All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for, for coming on this final day of OSS. My name is John Corbett, and I'm here to talk with a set of kernel developers about the work they do and where we stand in the kernel community. So I'd like to thank them all for being here and um, ask each of you, starting with Joseph here on my right, to, to introduce yourselves briefly to our audience. Hi, I'm uh, Joseph Basic. I'm uh, the technical lead for the file system group at, at Facebook, or Meta, sorry, uh, on the kernel team. I'm Dan Williams, I'm from the Core Linux, Core Linux kernel team at Intel. I'm a recovering developer of persistent memory, uh, now working on CXL and competential computing. I'm Anna Maria Bensen, working for Linotronix in the kernel team and working mainly on timer infrastructure. Yeah, I'm Alice. Um, I work at the Android Rust team at Google, where I'm working on some Rust drivers for the kernel. Um, in, I also do some Rust in user space, where I maintain a large library, open source library called Tokyo. All right. <laughs> So Rust has definitely been on a lot of people's minds. It was discussed with, with Linus a couple of days ago, discussed extensively yesterday at the Kernel Maintainer Summit. So a few of us were there, so I thought I would start by asking our, our token Rust developer here, um, how do you feel about how things went at the Maintainer Summit and the state of, of getting Rust into the, the Linux kernel? Yeah, um, I, think it, uh, I think it went well. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, things, things will take time, but I, uh, I'm positive that we will be making progress. So certainly there's been some frustration in some quarters about just how long it is taking. I think that some people wanted Rust to, uh, to take over the world a bit more quickly than it has. So, you know, you've been working to get a specific Rust component in, or at least several of them, actually. Uh, do, do you feel that it's taking too long? Is, is the process too slow, too conservative? Maybe. I mean, there are cer certainly things that I you know, wish were already in. Um, and some things have gone in faster. I don't know. We'll, yeah. <laughs> things can always be better, I guess. Things can always but, uh, be But I don't know. I was going to say, it, it took me like a couple of years to add one flag to the MMAP syscall. And in, in comparison for, for Rust trying to add a, an entire language, I think things are going at pace uh, that, that they're expected to go. Joseph, yeah. you were talking about adding some Rust stuff into ButterFS, possibly. Yeah, so I think that like yeah, we end up the kernel developers are, tend to be very conservative, right? And we kind of end up with a lot of things where it's, there's just like hesitancy because of, you know, the, one of the big things that I've seen is like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to review this or, or debug it because I don't understand it. Um, and like to a certain degree, you just kind of like have to like push through, right? You just have to like do the thing and then find out what the problems are and, and go forward. And because Rust does integrate so well into C, like I had, um, you know, I, I had thoughts of converting a, a small section of ButterFS that is like only in, inside of ButterFS, right? In order to kind of like proof of concept, like, okay, what does this look like for us? And like, let's get it done and get the mechanics. And at the time, this was like a year ago, just, just the tooling in like, how do I build the kernel with Rust enabled was like problematic. Not problematic, it was just like annoying to work with in the version of the, the distro that I had at the time. And like, I think that's, that's, part of it, right, is that the, the mechanics of, of getting it going, um, like, they're not, they're not big, but they're enough to make me go, okay, well, like, I'll deal with this later, right? I'll wait for, like, the support to be a little bit more mature so I can just turn it on and go. Because if I do this thing, all of a sudden I lose, you know, kernel build bots, and I lose a few other things, and I have to go rework my my testing environment to make sure that it'll build or whatever. So, like the the just the little silly annoyances are enough to like kind of for somebody that's like excited about it, right? Like I'm super excited to have it. It's like enough for me to go, okay, well, like I'll I'll come back to this, right? So it's not so much of like I don't want to do it. It's just like, oh, okay, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to leave it for an exercise in the future. 
which obviously like this is getting better. I could probably have a better time of it now, but you know, I think it's, it's a pretty radical change, you know, radical for us, right? <laughs> um, and even for people that, are, that want to be involved, if they don't have like dedicated time to it, it's, it's still just like the barrier to entry is a little bit higher. So when we've talked about Rust, we mostly talk about it on the periphery at this point, device drivers, things like that. Anna Maria, you've recently rewritten much of our core timer <laughs> framework, um, infrastructure way, way down deep in the core of the kernel. Should that still be in C? Can we, can we switch that to Rust at some point? And I think there are already some attempts to also make timers, um, or there are some patches around. <laughs> Yeah, there um, were some patches this morning <laughs> about uh, using timers from Rust. I saw that, yeah. And um, I think, yeah, why not? But the, I think at the moment, the maintainer team of the timers is not capable of, um, or not very um, good, uh, good in understanding Rust. So there needs to be some more effort on this side to educate also the maintainers to be able to understand it. And to be able to review it, sure you can review it from a from a more theoretical perspective. Like, is um, um, are the rules how we want to use timers? Are they followed? But um, on the other hand, I think it's also important also for the maintainers where Rust should be also involved in, the, in those subsubs, subsystems um, that they also um, get some better understanding of Rust. Yeah, one of the things I, I think have, um, let's say, is a success, looks like a successful approach to me is to take a kernel developer on one side and take a Rust expert on the other side and put them together. And I did this, for example, with the, the work queue. I had a call with the maintainer where, you know, we, we went through the patch together and, you know, I'm new to kernel development, at least I was at the time, and um, he was uh, you know, new to Rust, and then we could uh, learn from each other. And yeah, I think, uh, I think that kind of approach is going to be good, um, learning from each other uh, that way. So we will definitely come back to you <laughs> to, to get some of your Rust knowledge there. Yeah. I, I like this aspect of Rust where it's like, a code review after the fact, like this is this substance has been there for a long time, but now we have to we have to look at it again in a new in a new light with new energy. And I think that's a really a really healthy thing for the kernel. Yeah, um, one of the things that's come out of a lot of the um, the Rust work is also documentation because. Wait, what documentation? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I. I I think documentation is, you know, a big part of the Rust community as well. Um, earlier this year, I had a, another talk at the Rust Nation where I talked a lot about documentation in Tokyo. So, um, and I think that having good documentation is actually part of the Rust community as well, in such, to some extent. I've seen this too, and like it's been a forcing function. Like it. it I've noticed, like Vero, Al Vero, who, who maintains, helps maintain the VFS subsystem, has gone and like really looked at lifetimes of some of our more complicated things. And I know his opinions of Rust are, are you know, neutral. Well, I would say neutral, given yeah. it's Vero. Um, but like he has taken very seriously like some of these things where like you know, we have really strange lifetime rules. And I've even run into this with just like, how we do LRU and like it's just not standard and it makes it really frustrating to like get it integrated into Rust and you know he had this long patch series with a 75 page documentation on like what he was doing and all the problems and reworked a lot of the lifetime stuff so it made sense right and so you could do things like scoped referencing and all that stuff and yes I know that maybe his some views on Rust are not as positive, but it's at least forced him to go look at some of these things and which will set up for converting it to Rust a lot simpler because now the the lifetime makes more sense, right? And it's documented and it has like clear rules. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's a is getting this kind of cleanup boulder rolling down the hill rolling down the hill. There's some pain to get it started, but the beneficial things are coming out of this. Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I think that's where some of the tension comes from too sometimes though. Um, if you look at how a C API in the kernel design, it's, you know, call it this way, you have to make sure to call it this way and that pointer better not be null and don't touch that button over there or the whole thing will explode, right? The, the Rust approach is we're gonna design an API so that if the compiler lets you call it, your code is probably correct. It's a very different approach to how you do things, something that C just doesn't let you do. But when we're trying to design Rust APIs for the kernel, they have to sit on top of these C APIs. And so there's a fundamental mismatch in the approach that's being taken. And I see that as pushing back into the C APIs and trying to force changes there. I think the changes are good, okay. but I think that it creates some resistance in the, in the maintainers of the existing APIs who have put decades into, into creating and using those APIs and know where the pitfalls are and can instinctively avoid them. Um, how can we get around this sort of, of thing, or should we try to get around it? Well, I, I always say that, with, especially about the kernel community, you cannot go around problems. Like, you have to, you have to go through it. And, and there's an, there, there is an impedance. And I think, I think one of the reasons Rust is going to succeed is because of the enthusiasm uh, of its, of its the people, the proponents of it. Like, I, I think any other language might, might have probably given up by now. But, th but that impedance match, like, I, I don't think the Rust people understood how big that impedance match is, but now they're in it, and, and, and I see them co continuing to make, make slow progress through it. But yeah, you can't go around these problems. You have to, you have to go through them. Um, but when you successfully go through them, now you've converted people into, um, into the benefits. But yeah, it, it, going, through, going, th going through it is, is not for everybody. Well, I, th I think the other thing around, like, you know, around designing decent APIs, right? I think a lot of, you know, I, I've been using these forever, and in trying to train new people, right, and bring in new people, I get a lot of, like, well, why does it work like that? And I have to be like, oh, that is, that is pretty dumb, isn't it? Right? And so there's, unfortunately, for kernel development, it's so hard to get into that, like, you just kind of ignore a lot of things when you're getting to it. Like, oh, wow, like, this, this API sucks. But, like, once you fit, once you get through it and you don't have to touch it anymore, you just, like, forget the pain. And, and I think we're getting a lot better about Addre like addressing that pain head on, being like, you know, okay, well, this is, this is, I got it to work, but this isn't great, so let's, let's maybe rework it. Like, I think that, you know, Willie's work around folios is kind of a good example of this. Like, the way file systems used page cache, like, it was very ad hoc and very, like, oh, I saw this guy do it over here, so I'm going to copy it over here. So we copied a lot of bad behavior throughout the entire stack, and, and partly because there was no really like fixed API. It was just like, yeah, here's the object, do what you want. And instead of doing, you know, instead of giving us full unfettered access to everything, actually think about like, okay, what do we want the entry points to these, these APIs to look like? And, and Rust forces you to do that, right? Because now you have to do it correctly. And, you know, I, for example, have been looking at like how we use inodes, so like, like, Small, like objects inside of the VFS that are very integral or whatever. I was like, okay, we have 37 public functions that a, a file system can call into and most of us don't use any of them. I was like, okay, can we delete them? And can we start removing code and simplifying? And when we simplify, it kind of makes everybody's life easier. Yeah, when I have been you know, writing Rust abstractions to call into C APIs, you know, my approach started out being, yeah, I'll try to you know, understand how does the C code work and then model that accurately in Rust, which sometimes is easy and sometimes requires you know, stretching the limits of what Rust can do. Um, but one thing I've been repeatedly positively surprised by is several different kernel developers saying, you know, maybe we should just change the C API because you know, maybe the fact that this is difficult to do shows uh, deficiency in the C API, and sometimes that's the case. And, and, and you know, sometimes, sometimes there are good reasons to do weird stuff, and that's fine, and we will, you know, stretch the limits of what Rust can do. And, and, and you know, sometimes the C API has, like, 90% of the users are like this, and then 10% uses it in a weird way. 
in principle, we could design the Rust API to you know, do it in the common way, and then you wouldn't be able to use that API to do the weird thing. That's an option. Uh, one thing Greg has repeatedly told me is, yeah, like this thing that you can do, like I want people to stop doing this. So why don't you like design your Rust API so people can't do this? Like, I think there was something like missed device. Like, you need to use the auto-generated numbers. Don't pick your own. Right. Um, and yeah, I yeah, you know, let's uh, let's improve the APIs while we're at it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to ask, because you've done a lot of re refactoring work, and, and um, like, is bringing a new language about the same level of difficulty as refactoring old, old C APIs and C subsystems? I'm not sure if, it's, if you can compare it or if, if it's definitely the same difficult, because mm -hmm. it, I think it also hardly depends on the subsystem and also on the people working in the subsystem and also on the mindset of the people working in the subsystem. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult to like, find a common way to refactor things. And the other thing is when you start to refactor things, um, you have to d don't lose your aim because, or don't lose your goal because on the way of the refactoring you see, oh, this is ugly, this is ugly, oh, this is copied, 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 copied. I should clean up this, and documentation is missing there. I do not understand this. So this is something I had a big problem with, like um, when refactoring things or when going to, for example, this thing I implemented there, I, I did on the way to, to my final goal to get this into the kernel, um, I did a lot of cleanup on the site. And I still have a long list on possible cleanups where we can go. So, for example, I think it's also a benefit when <coughs> Rust wants to understand all the API stuff and wants to see what's going on there. How does it work? Documentation is missing, so this could be cleaned up. But even if you only update documentation, this is a good point. But if you then go deeper into the functions and try to understand what's going on there, you, you might start to see some inconsistency on some p points and start to see why do we do it in, in this way? Or why does it every architecture in a similar way, but not in the same way, but nearly copied, but I don't know, one single part is a little bit changed. Couldn't we find a common way there? And I think this is a, definitely a benefit if this process goes into this direction that this cleanup also happens because I don't know, every time when I have a look or try to understand something, I definitely find at least one thing which could be cleaned up. So it's, it's yeah. Only one? <laughs> definitely one. <laughs> at least one. Was, was it Al Beer that said, open up the kernel, look at any, any, any code file, and stare at it long enough and a bug will fall out? No. Indeed. So kind of to, to transition just a little bit, one of the reasons that has been put forward for bringing Rust into the kernel is its potential to bring in a new generation of kernel developers. Because um, like any community, we wish to continue to attract developers and grow. And even though we do get over 200 new developers in every kernel release, they don't necessarily hang around. And we need to be thinking about our, the future of our community. So just kind of think about that topic. I'd actually like to ask each of you, first of all, how is it that you got into kernel development? And do you think that was a good idea? <laughs> Alice. Yeah, you know, the way I got into kernel development, well, I was working on the user space part of this Android thing, Finder, where things talk to each other, and I was making it usable from Rust in user space, because, you know, we we're also trying to use Rust outside of the kernel. Um, and then, you know, I finished this, and then, um, Eventually, you know, we had some reasons to approve the C driver, and we thought that, well, this is going to be really difficult because this was really a non-trivial improvement. And, you know, the, the binder driver is super security critical, so we thought it's going to, if I do this in the C code, I'm going to introduce a bunch of security vulnerabilities. There's no way around it. And so um, we decided to look at this Rust driver instead, and uh, yeah, here I am. Yeah, <laughs> I have it here. 
this phone runs my Rust driver. <laughs> so uh, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I came to kernel development. I in, at university, I just had this configuring uh, or trying to get Linux running on a Carrera car. And um, yeah, in the end, uh, I started to work at Linotronics. And yeah, I got some tasks to work for uh, with timers and help with cleaning up CPU hot plug. Um, this was work which was related to the um, bringing preempt RT um, into mainline. Yeah. and. I, I'm still still there and still working, and I think in the end it's a, it was a good idea. It was a good decision, even if it's sometimes frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had an internship in, in high school in the IT department at an airbag plant. Um, the, it, they were running VMS and Novel Netware, but one of the guys said, "Hey, come come check this out." And he said, "And like, what is it?" And showed me it was KDE running running Linux. I'm like, "What is Linux?" Um, and we had we had storage arrays at work, and he's and he, we, somehow I got introduced that Linux had a, had a RAID stack, and I knew nothing about kernel development, but I wanted I just wanted to set up a, a RAID array at home, and I found Ingo's patches. Ingo had a, his out of tree MDDM patches. And I figured out how to apply them and run it, and. Um, and I was hooked at that point. Like I can, I can magically find new functionality on the internet for free and make my computer do it. And, and I was hooked at that point. Uh, so like um, I grew up uh, relatively poor, and so uh, I was working cutting grass to like build my own computer. So I was like buying the components one at a time, like over a couple of weeks. Um, and having to buy Windows at the time was like $110, which you know for me was uh, exorbitantly high. And so I, I found a copy of Mandrake um, uh, for like five bucks at like I think it was Sam's Club or something like that. I was like, all right, well that's that's good enough for me. And so I installed Mandrake, but my um, network card didn't like the driver that came with Mandrake didn't work. So I'd like f download um, uh, the kernel on uh, at school and install it. And so from there I was like, oh, well, I can like actually look at code and learn how to code there. And so that got me like. You know, I think it was like 14 or something. I was like, I want to be a kernel developer, which is silly, <laughs> and I have deep regrets. But <laughs> no, I, I think, generally speaking, it's a good. I, you know, I love it as much as I complain. So, imagine there are some folks in this audience who are thinking about joining our community and and would like to become kernel developers with us. What what advice would would you have to offer them? How to get started in all of this? What, what should people do? I think find, you know, what you're passionate about, like, matters. Because, like most things, right, you're going to run into obstacles. And if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to want to push through. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, well, I'm passionate about a lot of things. But file systems was, I was really passionate about it. So, you know, it's, it's kept me in the community, even though I, I do tend to get frustrated. And... You're, you're not going to be able to, like, you're going to run into frustrations, really, with anything. And the kernel community is not, not unique in that fact. And so you can't just go into it like, I want to do this. Like, I just want to be a kernel developer. It's like, I am passionate about this particular field in, in, in the kernel. And, and I want to go learn as much about it as possible and, and, and be, be involved. Yeah. It you have, to, you have to have that specific itch you need to scratch a, a, a piece of hardware you have you want it to get working, a, a, a bug you want to solve. Um, and that has to be the thing that keeps you going because, yeah, passion is good, but also passion can, uh, can, can face, face headwinds. And so as, as long as you focus on that one problem you want to solve, you, you find that, oh, wait, I now have enough expertise to solve a little slightly harder problem in another, another direction than it. And a steamrolls, but yeah, you have you have to kind of get that first first contribution. Yeah, maybe also be open-minded and don't be only focused on I want to go definitely there. For me, it was very important that I had a supervisor who, who helped me or also supported me and so explained me stuff. But th for me, it was important to have this face-to-face -face contact and not only writing emails because, f for example, if I just 
would have get the feedback via email, I think I wouldn't work for the kernel today because it's different to get the answer or review remarks only via email and do not know the person behind it because you do not know how the person is in, 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 in a real person and sometimes writing is more harsh than um, they would, if you know the person and know, okay, it's the way of the person to tell things to someone, but it's not mean. So um, this is definitely one thing. Have a supervisor also where you are able to talk face to face to clarify things in a fast way because email is takes quite some time and yeah. And have the power to not be frustrated very soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh it's difficult to do alone, I think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's also interesting to think about that you don't necessarily have to put code into the kernel itself to help the kernel. Um, there's a uh, contributor that recently uh, has been helping me a lot out with uh, changes in the Rust compiler that uh, we needed to use Rust in the kernel. Um, so it's important to think that there are also other avenues to help out Rust, to help out the kernel than just, you know, writing kernel code. Um, yeah. Do you think you've kind of entered this, like, earlier in Linux, Linux's lifetime, like, the, the, problems, the problems were simpler, and, and, and one person maybe could, could solve a problem, but now it's to the point where things are so interconnected and complicated that you, that you have to have that connection to somebody to, yeah. to, to collaborate with. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing is also in core code, a lot of things are not well documented. So if you are new to it and you only read the code, you got frustrated very, very soon. And you, then you have the possibility to ask someone who did this code and say, OK, please help me. Git blame didn't help me. <laughs> the explanations were like, I don't know. I think that we should yeah, have this documentation also. Um, for the new people. I, th I remember there was a panel where I was talking years ago, and there were, we also had this documentation topic, like it should improve also in core code. And if it's, it's hard to improve it, I know, but um, on the other hand, then you have to don't be shy and don't uh, try and think, okay, I cannot ask the person who wrote the code, just send them a message and say, okay, I have a problem here. I do not, definitely not understand what's going on there. And even if it might be a, a silly question or a dumb question, but I think this is not exist. Does, this does not exist. No. That, that's something we could kind of wander into a bit. Um, having heard a lot about the deficiencies of the documentation, and taking that just a little bit personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's not against you. <laughs> I mean, there are many parts of our community, and this is certainly not limited to the kernel, that are very much underinvested in. I, I like to point out that we have thousands of developers paid to work on the Linux kernel. There's not a single one who is paid to do documentation, not one, right? The, the, the money is just not there to do that. And that extends to many other areas, including you know, core kernel areas that have been underinvested in for many years. Um, you know, our build system is maintained by a single person uh, and nobody else even understands it. Um, there, there are a lot of areas like that that just don't see the investment. I wonder if we have any thoughts on why that is and how we can improve that. So, um, the, uh, I'm particularly passionate about, you know, I think all of us up here are about documentation, right? And especially, you know, the kernel tends to add, add new interfaces every release, but oftentimes these interfaces are not documented, which is you know another pet peeve of mine. And so recently, I've been working to document some of the, the interfaces that we've done, and you know this goes through our Linux man um, uh, project, which you know has been unmaintained and then maintained sporadically throughout its its lifetime, and. You, you know, because you posted this, uh, Alejandro, the guy who, who was maintaining it, recently announced that he was stepping down because he just, he, he can't afford to, to do it for free and he doesn't have the time. And so I've been, you know, running around trying to find um, 
funding for this, and I've been talking to Linux Foundation. We have it set up to to write a um, a uh, sponsorship contract for them, and you know Meta is chipping in money, and and I'm finding other companies to chip in money because this needs to not just be like one company does it. It's like it it's a uh, uh, it's important to all of us, so it should be spread around. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about this, and it's silly that like such a core important part isn't funded. Like, there's no reason why we shouldn't be funding it. Which is, you know, I, um, you know, for the last two or three weeks, I've been my head has been in a bug thing, and then sending emails to people begging for money for this. Like, it's. And I, I think the support is there, right? Like anybody, like I've had many people come back like, yeah, of course, absolutely, we wanna fund this work. So I think the, I think the impetus is there and like the, the, the desire is there. It's just like having somebody be like, oh, like I, can I get paid for this, <laughs> right? And, and figuring it out. Yeah, but it would, wouldn't it also be possible to make this, for example, improved documentation part of the review? So in case I see something new and I see them definitely is totally undocumented, the function description is not there or whatever, or there's no, nothing in there, wouldn't this also be like a list on a review? This is how review should work, and you also should have a, um, yeah, important view on, or make this documentation also an important part of the review to say, okay, you, if you want to, bring in something new, or if you want to change it, you have to document it, not only in commit message, also in the code itself. Yeah, I, that's something I do for Tokyo, with you know, the other project I maintain. When we get pull requests, one of the things you have to add to add your new function is you have to document it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a required part of the process, just like adding tests. Yeah. So that, that has been a perennial thing that's come up at kernel summits and such since I started doing them maybe 25 years ago almost um, the, to impose a requirement like that and we've never found the the strength to do that I'm not quite sure why I think that at least for for syscalls interfaces you know historically it's been that there's not been consistent maintainership for Linux man so it's like you go to like first of all it's annoying to write a man page which I don't I don't view as like a reason to not do it, right? Like I find it annoying, but it's still important to have the documentation. So I go and do it and then spend 17 emails of him telling me all the stupid things that I've done, right? But like that's just part of the process. But the fact that I had a maintainer to go back and forth with to get it done is like why it went there. And without having consistent maintainership there, like it's easy for us to be like, oh, well, there's nobody there to take my patch, so why should I even bother, right? And I think that the first step is that we do have somebody that like, no, listen, you have no excuse anymore. There's somebody whose job it is to take your patch and review it and, and help you get it in or whatever. So making it part of the, the process is, is important. You know, file systems have done this with tests, right? Like you don't get your thing merged unless we have FS tests set up to test the functionality that you're adding, right? And taking that the next step to, to adding the documentation of the interface is, is an easy and natural one, it's been, but it's also been easy for us to ignore it because we haven't had consistent maintainership in that area. Yeah, and another concept I came across a few years ago is, you know, there's this issue of like, how do you frame adding documentation? And what if you say that missing documentation, that's a bug, right? So you can have, um, you know, in your form for reporting a bug, in your library, you can say, well, if you want to report this kind of bug, you use this form. If you want to report a documentation bug, you use this kind of form. Um, and framing it as a bug that you, know, you can have an issue for and that could be a you know, good first issue for a new contributor, that's also something I like to go that route as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think, I mean, I'm really glad you stepped up and, and just, just started jumping in to, to find funding for thing, these things. It, it seems like a problem that this industry can solve, like we all care about these common things. We should be able to find funding for these things. And another thing I would say is um, something that's happening with my, with my own company is kind of giving people time to work on the commons. Like, it's not just about 
pushing through your one new feature for your one new thing. Like you, if you're not taking care, care of the rest of the kernel, it's, uh, it's, it's a responsibility, but, but it also builds influence. Like the, the, the person that can go across kernel, clean things up, make, make things better for everybody is somebody that gets invited to, to conversations, uh, gets to have their opinion heard a little bit more, more closely. And so it, it's, it's, it's not just altruism, it's y your company gets, gets influenced by your, your developers showing up in the community in invisible ways. It's definitely useful. And in my mind, underinvestment goes way beyond documentation. You know, yesterday at the maintainer summit, we were informed that, that our regression tracker, right? Tracking regression seems like a fairly important task. And that person is now doing that completely unfunded and um, is getting a little tired of that. Um, and again, core kernel work, you know, in the Rust area, we have one compiler, but GCC does not still compile Rust, which means that there are targets that the kernel is built for that are not, that cannot have Rust code in them. And very few people are working on, on getting GCC to compile Rust. And I'm, I don't know, it's just, it's a persistent problem that goes, like I said, well beyond the kernel. Um, another one, maybe to start to close on a happier note, a, a very much an underinvested area for a long time was, was real time, which struggled for a long time to find in people to support the work on, on real time Linux, even though there were companies that were shipping it as products. And they were not funding its development. So the real time people, I saw the print K patches went in yesterday, I think. I'm only about 5,000 patches behind on the merge window at the moment. <laughs> but um, I think it's a, you know, it's a testament that we can do long-term projects, that a 20-year project is essentially completing this week. Um, and it's something to celebrate. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe Rust will take 20 years, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But, I mean, but, but, but Thomas made the comment in the maintainer summit yesterday about like how the kernel community was kind of freaked out about preempt RT in the beginning, and we're kind of freaked out about Rust right now. But like it, it still it still made it through in the end. We get there in the end if we're we are patient enough. So in the last couple of minutes that we have, I just like to hear from each of you what what you want to work on in the future. Um, you know, where where do you see the kernel and your part of it going in in the near future? Uh, what can we look forward to? Start with you, Dan. Okay. Um, the I, I I work in this area that I I kind of coined device memory. Like the, the, we we have different ways of attaching memory, all, all kinds of uh, different types. And so it's it's no longer the case that you just have your CPU and memory. Now you have CXL over here. Maybe it's persistent. Maybe it's high bandwidth. So it's it's an interesting kind of new world of like, are we going to have application specific specific memory? Um, yeah. It, it's it's a, it's 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 a case where hardware is really really stressing out what our core mm has had to deal, had to deal with in the past, and so I'm interested to see to see where that goes. Um, and then after all of that, you have to make it make it make it secure. And combinational computing is 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 a is a hot topic that that uh, is we're we're going we're going to we're going to find out how to do combinational computing correctly at some point, and that'll be interesting. You are an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I just can speak for the timer part there. Um, I think the next year is the main goal is to clean up all the stuff so that a um, handover from the old maintainer who will maybe retire someday um, can go to the new maintainers um, and that everything is in a good shape and things which are unclear are solved before or at least understood by the new maintainers. I think this is an important part the timer should go through yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, you know, some of the Rust drivers starting to ship on real products someday. That, um, that would be really cool. Well, that may happen in the coming year. We will, we will yeah. see. I, too, am known to be an optimist. <laughs> Uh, I, I've been working a lot on Fuse and, and zero copy stuff. Uh, my, my goal for a few years now has been to push as much stuff into user space and much complexity into user space as possible. And between that and, and now zero copy and like enabling our, our 
our ability to like do things much more efficiently. You know, AI is very big, right? And so we end up moving memory through the stack a lot. So kind of solving that, so we're we're doing less copies and that kind of thing. Just efficiency around that area. So are we ever going to be done? Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But I think with regard to our time here, I think we are done. So I would like to thank all of you, Alice, Anna Maria, Dan, Joseph, for, for joining us here. And thanks to all of you for, for listening.